Yeah, I can hear you now. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, Ted, uh, you'd muted everybody, so uh, I was part of everybody. Oh, that's good. I, 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 I tested your technological uh, knowledge here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, welcome, Michael. Uh, I, I, I just uh, give a brief uh, overview of the agenda and then we get back to you with a few questions straight away. So I, I'll just show you this picture, all of you. So what we want to do today is, if you can see this, is today is to get a long-term view of money, debt and the economy including the different power struggles uh, over the ages. And we start from 2400 before Christ until today. So it goes through Babylonia and, and Sumer time to biblical times, Roman order, medieval banking, and to today. And that's a, a quite a big <laughs> uh, thing actually to cover, but we have the right man with us. And that is uh, Michael. So I just uh, say a few words. Uh, first, it's like uh, Michael has been advised to governments in, and, and in, is an expert on financial and real estate markets and actually history too on debt and money and the economy, which uh, is the reason that he's here today. He predicted the Latin American debt crash uh, in the 1980s and predicted the crisis of 2008. And uh, to today's uh, topic, uh, 40 years of research uh, into the origins of money debt and how the economy was organi organized way, way back. And uh, it's not like reading a book anymore because those were like <laughs> clay, <laughs> written in clay and things like that. So it's been a very, very big uh, uh, thing. But Michael, uh, could you please, Help me to introduce you, like, let's take uh, three of your defining assignments uh, or moments that you like to share in your career. If we start with the first one, like uh, with Chase. Well, my first major uh, job on Wall Street was becoming the balance of payments uh, economist for Chase Manhattan. And the very first task they gave me uh, in uh, late 1964 was to look at uh, the balance of payments of uh, there are three major Latin American creditors, uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, to see how much can they afford to borrow. And the idea was, I was to, uh, my job was to say, here is how much of an export surplus they can uh, raise for an exchange for. And the idea of the banks was that, uh, New York banks, was that all of the economic surplus would be paid for debt service. Uh, so that everything that they could uh, export to create a trade surplus, an investment surplus, a tourism surplus, uh, all if you put this all together, uh, you, you say, okay, they're generating, say, uh, uh, $2 billion a year. All of that can be paid as interest. So you calculate a loan, how much will uh, $2 billion uh, uh, pay as interest? How much of a loan uh, can that support? And say that'll be maybe uh, $20. $20 billion uh, loan. Well, it, I did my forecast. Here's the trade balance, the uh, tourism balance, the investment balance, and they were all in balance. They, couldn't, they, they weren't generating any surplus. So uh, uh, I said, wait a minute, if you, how are they going to repay more interest if they're not generating uh, a, an economic surplus uh, to pay in the first place? Well, you can imagine that this did not make me popular with the uh, international division within the bank because uh, bank officers uh, get uh, paid according to how many loans they can make because that's what the bank's business is, making loans. And if I said, wait a minute, they can't afford to repay, uh, I uh, was, was called Dr. Doom already in the 1960s. And uh, we had one meeting, I think, with the Federal Reserve uh, at a later point, And uh, they said, oh, Mr. Hudson, according to your analysis, Britain can't pay any additional loans, uh, can it? Uh, and I said, well, that's, that's pretty obvious. I think the pound you know, is going to be devalued. And they said, but uh, uh, we're always going to lend Britain the money to pay, aren't we? And I said, that's right. Uh, if the Federal Reserve and the US government lends Britain the money to pay the interest to keep itself, uh, then it can do it. And uh, the Fed guy said, well, then we can lend the Latin American governments if they're 
friendly government. In other words, we'll lend the dictators and the client oligarchies money to pay. But uh, if they were to vote for somebody we don't like, then we'll call in all the loans and we'll we'll strangle the economy. We'll uh, we'll uh, block them from importing. We'll devalue the currency. We'll create a crisis to say that's what you get for not voting for our guys. You want to try democracy? This is this is the free market where we get to bankrupt you if you don't like it. And uh, they, so they said, you know, it's not not a bad thing that the government makes the loans because we can control them. We can make sure that uh, 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 if they elect anyone we don't like anyone who wants land reform, anyone who wants independence, uh, anyone who won't privatize their oil and their natural resources, you can just uh, absolutely destroy them. So uh, I said, okay, I get it. Uh, if you lend them the money, then they can pay. Uh, this is like a Ponzi scheme. Uh, you lend the, uh, bar, uh, uh, the investors enough uh, to uh, pay the interest and keep, keep current. So that was my sort of introduction to uh, uh, how uh, the balance of payments uh, worked between the United States and the third world, and also how political the whole uh, uh, credit uh, pro uh, uh, problem was. Uh, and in fact, uh, David Rockefeller, who had taken over from George Champion at the bank over the Vietnam War, uh, George Champion had said in the, uh, uh, around 1963 and four that the Vietnam War was fiscally irresponsible uh, because it was ultimately going to force us off gold. Uh, and uh, uh, David Rockefeller, uh, uh, my, my boss at uh, Chase, uh, John Deaver said, but you know, that's the merchants of death argument in reverse. You're saying we can only go a war that we can afford. Well, that's, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that's putting, uh, that's wrong. We have to do what's right. We have to fight communism everywhere. And what is communism? Communism is nationalism. Communism is democracy. Communism is voting for somebody we don't like. Uh, we, uh, even if we can't afford it, we've got to do it. So uh, the rest of us at the Economic Research Department, every Friday, the Federal Reserve was going to come out with uh, its uh, 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 balance sheet of uh, uh, currency, money, currency, and gold. And you had the gold cover. Every uh, dollar of paper currency, every bill, uh, green bill in your uh, pocket had to be back 25% for gold. And we were watching the, the balance of payments uh, deficit uh, was draining and draining and draining uh, uh, gold, uh, uh, foreign exchange that was cashed in for gold by General de Gaulle in France and by Germany. And so we were all saying that at a certain point, uh, the dollar was going to have to uh, uh, stop gold convertibility. So that was the other uh, thing that we were, we were watching, how uh, the balance of payments, uh, uh, monetary theory is supposed to be all about uh, money being spent on goods and services, but the entire balance of payments deficit of the United States since 1950 was to pay for the war in Southeast Asia and for the 800 military bases that America had around the world. So the key to the balance of payments was military didn't have anything to do with uh, America's uh, prices and uh, wages and uh, all the things that academics uh, talked about. It was uh, what the academic uh, theorists leave out, where are the gunboats? So uh, that was my first uh, experience. So what you're saying is actually that U.S. had to get out, to get out of gold standard because they, it made themselves to be a Latin American country with the U.S. dollar loans. That's what you're saying. That was, that was what their worry was. Uh, my book on super imperialism showed uh, just the opposite. The yeah. going of gold actually helped, uh, uh, became a, a key to American uh, dominance. But at the time, they were very worried about going off gold. And there was a Columbia University group at that time of three people. My mentor, Terence McCarthy, uh, Seymour Melman, a uh, critic of the Pentagon, and myself. And uh, we were the three warning that the balance of payments, the war was going to force the government off gold. Well, I had to leave the bank to finish my dissertation because they kept giving me more and more work, which is what economists do at a bank. And I had to uh, get my PhD as a union card. And uh, then I went, I, I developed a whole balance of payments accounting format at Chase. Uh, and I went to Arthur Anderson, the accounting firm, uh, before they were uh, closed down for fraud, they were a major uh, uh, accounting firm. And I said, I want to do my analysis 
for the whole United States of, of its balance of payments. And uh, I worked for a whole year putting the US balance of payments together. And that's when I found the entire deficit uh, was all uh, uh, military. And uh, so they uh, had their art department draw up all the charts. Uh, but then one day my boss uh, came in uh, to my office and said, well, we just got a phone call uh, from Robert McMara and uh, the head of the Defense Department, uh, guy, the leader of the Vietnam War and the, uh, the Hawk. Uh, uh, he was an idiot savant, uh, very brilliant, but didn't know what to be brilliant about. Uh, and what was a tunnel vision, uh, uh, power mad uh, Irishman uh, who went on to lead the World Bank and uh, corrupt at any rate. Uh, uh, they said uh, that um, Arthur Anderson would never get another government contract if they didn't fire me on the spot and prevent uh, this uh, uh, criticism of the uh, uh, analysis of the balance of payments from coming out. So I took it to uh, New York universities. Uh, I got my PhD at New York University and I took it uh, to the business school and they immediately published it as a, a triple issue of the bulletin and that became uh, uh, a major uh, uh, to do it at that point. Well, that was in about 1968, 69. And it was obvious at that time that America was soon going to go off gold, uh, which it did. Well, uh, after that, uh, I became fairly well known because I'd, for, I'd forecast it and I'd explained how uh, once uh, countries go off gold, uh, America went off gold, other foreign central banks uh, said, what are we going to hold our our reserves in. Um, American government doesn't want us to buy gold. They, uh, the only thing we can buy is other, other government securities. And the only government securities around uh, are American treasury securities because nobody else is running the big a deficit to push all of these IOUs uh, into the uh, world market. So uh, uh, essentially I worked uh, for a, uh, I'd go up every month to uh, Canada uh, Montreal, Molson Rousseau, and uh, give uh, stock market reports and bond market reports. And that led to uh, the Canadian government uh, appointing me to uh, a head of study of uh, uh, how Canada should conduct itself. And this is 1978 uh, in this new monetary order where it couldn't get gold anymore. And the problem in Canada was uh, in the late 1960s, uh, and especially in the 1970s, interest rates are going up very rapidly in the United States and uh, uh, Canada and the whole Western world. And they were going up because of the shortage of credit uh, because of war financing uh, again. And uh, the Canadian, uh, the, uh, in the past, uh, the uh, Bank of Canada had been sort of a, an ideal, wonderful monetary model, World War II, uh, the 50s, uh, but uh, the commercial banks had been increasing their political power over Canada. And uh, when uh, the Canadian provinces wanted to borrow, uh, instead of paying like uh, maybe five and a half or six percent, uh, when they needed to fund their own uh, provincial development, uh, roads and the kind of thing that provinces or states spend their money on, uh, the banks went to them and said, well, you know, you can save a quarter, maybe half a percentage point in interest, instead of borrowing uh, from Canadian banks, uh, you can borrow from uh, uh, Swiss banks and German banks. You can borrow in Swiss francs or German marks, uh, and uh, the, uh, the price is uh, much less. Uh, you'll, you'll get a much uh, cheaper loan. Well, I, my argument was, wait a minute, uh, it's completely unnecessary. Let's look at what happens when a government like Canada borrows foreign exchange from Germany or France. Uh, the, uh, the province will have the banks issue a bond issue to be paid uh, in Switzerland or Germany to be subscribed in Swiss francs or German marks. Then the province will take these Swiss francs and German marks and they turn them over to the central bank, the Bank of Canada, in exchange for domestic Canadian currency. Uh, and the, uh, that's because provinces don't spend foreign exchange on building bridges and hiring labor and building hospitals. They use domestic currency. And I said, oh, wait a minute, if uh, the Canadian government is going to be creating this money in any case, 
then it's no, why doesn't it just print all the money to begin with? It can simply print a uh, uh, billion dollar, Canadian dollars uh, and charge whatever interest it wants. It could charge zero interest. Why, why do you uh, have to borrow, go through the charade of borrowing Swiss francs and German marks and foreign currency if you're just going to turn it into domestic currency? Well, meanwhile, the foreign, uh, the uh, provinces are borrowing so much money that the Canadian dollar went up from about 90 cents to a dollar six. Uh, I mean, it was all increasing uh, uh, the currency with all this foreign currency borrowing inflow. Well, uh, we had, a, again, a stormy meeting with the banks and the bank said, well, we're honest brokers. The bank that was saying this was certainly the crookedest money laundering bank in Canada, uh, the uh, Scotia Bank. And uh, they said, you need us as an honest broker. You can't trust the government. Government's bad. And they brought in a Catholic uh, priest who said, uh, what uh, Mr. Hudson is proposing is the way to the gas chambers. Any government decision is the way to Nazi Germany. It's uh, ga the gas chambers. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, supporting the government. Don't let the government make any decision at all. Only the Swiss banks and the German banks can make a decision because only the bankers are honest and smart. And I went, oh my God, here's the, uh, the, uh, the, the banks in Canada uh, were, uh, I must say, uh, uh, in involved in uh, money laundering and uh, pretty crooked, I thought, uh, what can I do? Well, at any rate, the government uh, published my uh, report uh, from the Institute of Research and Public Policy, Canada in the New Monetary Order, and uh, they, uh, uh, I, I got a landed immigrant status for all that. And, uh, they actually wanted me to put together uh, a, uh, uh, a report on what uh, the government could do to change uh, uh, the personality of Canadians because they said, I can see, uh, uh, Michael, that we have a problem here. Well, first of all, my main client at uh, one of the Toronto banks who had been in charge of investment became head of the personnel department because he said, there's a problem. When I hire economists, they're tunnel vision. It's a, they, they don't understand, they don't have a sense of reality. Well, the government said, okay, we're going to hire you by the Department of State, which in Canada is funds educated, not foreign affairs, but domestic education, the film uh, 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 industry. And my idea was, what can you do to uh, 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 explain, to create some kind of a group in Canada that is reality based? and doesn't just believe what economic models say and uh, doesn't simply rely on the United States. So that was uh, a byproduct of that. Well, it, right after that, uh, I uh, got involved with UNITAR, the United Nations Institute of Training and Research that uh, uh, was under uh, Irvin Laszlo, a, a systems analyst, uh, was doing a study of North-South relations. And uh, I wrote three major articles and presentations for them uh, saying that uh, this was in 1969, uh, 1970, saying there's no way that Latin American countries uh, and the other uh, uh, Southern hemisphere countries can pay their foreign debts. They're about to default. Uh, uh, this was the analysis that I began at Chase Manhattan. And I said, uh, are they going to default? You have to begin talking about how you're going to cancel the debts. Because if you don't cancel the debts and you don't write them down, then uh, you're going to have the IMF come in. You're going to impose austerity. Their economic growth is going to stop and uh, their economies are going to shrink. Uh, so uh, UNITAR uh, uh, had a big meeting in Mexico City. Mexico's president uh, wanted to be head of the United Nations. So he put up uh, the money for a big uh, UNITAR uh, meeting and uh, we went down there and I, I gave my usual uh, presentation saying uh, there's going to be uh, a, a debt crisis. You know, yeah, you've got to begin talking about writing down debts to the ability to pay. And if you don't write down that if the banks make a loan that can't be paid, you have to treat this as a bad loan. It's not a bad debt, it's a bad loan. The banks knew that the countries can't pay. And I, I thought that a basic principle of international law should be that if uh, 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 creditors make loans to countries that cannot be paid, the assumption should be that uh, 
it's intention that it, they know it won't be paid. It's intentional and they want the consequences. They want to drive the country bankrupt. They want to grab its oil and its raw materials uh, and to use debt as a lever to essentially uh, strip the assets of the country and transfer them into the uh, creditor countries, uh, especially the United States, which could create all the credit it wanted uh, simply on the printing press. Well, there was a riot, needless to say, there was a riot uh, uh, there. And uh, that led me realize uh, that this is really an important topic and that other people didn't want to understand it. That uh, what was obvious for me, just from drawing my graphs, I'd, I'd spent maybe 10 years, uh, by that time, 20 years, since 1960 to about 1980, most of my time was making, drawing statistics, making graphs of them, uh, being a quantitative empirical uh, chart uh, drawer. So, you know, I could see that that's important. And, but, and then I thought, I've got to decide to write a history of uh, how countries have coped with, uh, without paying debt, debts uh, in the past. And I said, the fact is, that uh, in the end, almost nobody's been able to pay the debt. And that's because simply of the mathematics of compound interest. Uh, exp it's exponential. Uh, interest accumulates and accumulates and any rate of interest is a doubling time. So the debts, uh, uh, if you leave them in interest, uh, they double, they redouble and they, they keep on growing. Uh, and so I began to do uh, historical uh, studies uh, at that point too. And I realized uh, it doesn't help my drawing charts. Uh, people just get angry at it. And most people uh, uh, who are not economists and are not in the financial sector are not all that interested in looking at charts. They need it sort of wrapped in uh, a big picture. So I've got to uh, begin uh, framing my, uh, uh, my points in the big picture. Well, of course, in 1982, Mexico announced that it couldn't uh, pay the debt, uh, it was a virtual default. And the result was after 1982, you had the Latin American debt bomb. Uh, the Latin American countries all defaulted, uh, they, they couldn't pay and everything that I'd forecast uh, pretty much uh, uh, came true. Uh, but it uh, wasn't politically correct for me to say it. I, they said, I, people told me that I was like a premature anti-fascist. Uh, I was warning about the problem uh, before it occurred. And uh, uh, I think uh, I worked uh, at the Hudson Institute with Herman Kahn for many years. We were, went around uh, the world and he'd usually introduce me as Dr. Doom. Uh, there was an, an, a few other Dr. Dooms. They were all financial. Uh, Al Wojnar was one. Uh, Paul, uh, Henry Kaufman was one. We were all warning that the debts couldn't be paid. And uh, people thought that, well, we must uh, have a, a, a psychological desire for them not to be paid. People would ask uh, us, well, isn't is it that you don't want the debts to be paid? Why do you want to believe that there's going to be a crisis? I mean, they, they, uh, they couldn't believe that we were actually making charts uh, showing where's the money uh, yeah. and follow the money. And in this case, we followed the debt. So that, that led me uh, uh, into my historical studies. So yeah, it seems like you have a quite uh, um... Uh, extensive experience from the politics of uh, uh, external debt, I would say. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, uh, so let's if if you get so thank you for that introduction and background because it's quite clear that what you're saying. If if a country have external debts, it's a problem for them. If people have uh, you know debt to someone, it's a problem for them. And what you actually said, it should be a business risk. You know, the the, the it would be a bad loan rather than a bad debt. So. If you give away if you if you give away your loan uh, uh, and uh, actually haven't done your due diligence that you know it's a bad loan, you should take the business risk. It seems like that's what you're saying. And could could you share anything about your uh, history if you go back to the Babylonian time or Sumer and you know what happened that or if you start with like the origin of uh, of credit and money and how the structure the society at that time. Well, I spent the year, uh, I think 1980, 1981, uh, going back in history, and it was easy to go back to medieval European times, uh, the Templars, uh, go back to Greece and Rome, who uh, all of Greece and Rome was just the constant uh, uh, revolts uh, trying to cancel the debts. Uh, and uh, 
also in the Bible, of course, you had uh, uh, the Jubilee year. Uh, and at that time, almost all the commentators uh, around 1981 said that, well, the Jubilee year was, this was all utopian, couldn't have really happened. Uh, and there were references I found to uh, Babylonian antecedents, but there, nobody had written an economic history of uh, uh, the ancient Near East. Uh, there were years and years of journal articles. Uh, if you look through what had been written, uh, you wouldn't find debt anywhere in the index of any of these. We knew that there were proclamations. So I began to read, uh, I had literally everything that there had been printed in any economic journal in any language uh, about uh, the ancient Near East. And I, I found that indeed, uh, in order to understand uh, the origins of debt, uh, you had to understand uh, the whole context. And uh, that uh, I found that indeed there had been debt cancellations. Uh, and indeed, uh, these were uh, not only uh, attested by legal records, but they were uh, every ruler in the Near East when they would come to power from Sumerian times, uh, Entamina, uh, uh, Erupagina, uh, uh, down through uh, Hammurabi's dynasty, uh, the first rulers upon taking the throne would proclaim a clean slate to cancel the debts, to return land uh, to uh, creditor, to debtors who'd forfeited them to creditors, and you'd free the bond servants. Uh, same thing, it, literally word for word, uh, what you get in the, uh, uh, the biblical jubilee year. Uh, in 1984, uh, this began a process that I, I, would, I spent the next 35 years on. In 1984, uh, I uh, was brought up to Harvard and uh, joined uh, uh, the faculty as a research associate of the Peabody Museum, which was their archaeology anthropology department. And uh, we decided, uh, because there wasn't any history, that uh, I was going to organize a, theory, a series of colloquia uh, and, uh, on, and invite the leading uh, uh, experts in Egyptology, Assyriology, Sumer, Babylonia, other Near Eastern countries, uh, each to say in their period, how did the, uh, these uh, societies handle, uh, handle debt? How did money, how did the rate of interest come to be uh, uh, developed? How did they, uh, de what did they use for money? And uh, I, it was pretty much only toward the end of this long research we had, we published five major co uh, colloquia uh, of my Harvard group, all from uh, uh, that uh, I've, I've co-edited. And uh, if you, in order to explain what money is, we, we had to say, well, how did civilization develop uh, its economics? Well, it probably began in the late Neolithic. Uh, in the late Neolithic, how do you organize a uh, society when uh, you have uh, the individual economy of every people worked on the land, they cultivate, uh, uh, their own, they grow their own crops, uh, they have cattle, they dig uh, canals, but they also needed who's going to build the temples, who's going to build the pyramids, who's going to build the city walls to protect them, who's going to do the major irrigation works, who's going to work on the, what today is called infrastructure. Well, and, and uh, how, who's going to serve in the army uh, because they were fighting all the time. Uh, and uh, how are you going to organize a society both to build infrastructure and, and fight? And so the answer was uh, you would assign land to uh, everybody in a standardized plot and the land would be, uh, you'll get as much land as is necessary to pay a given tax. The tax is originally in labor. Uh, if, if we're going to give you a, a family-sized plot, you have to have two people serving as, as uh, labor during the non-harvesting season to build the walls, to carry the dirt, uh, uh, to dig, to dig uh, uh, irrigation canals, to build pyramids. Uh, and uh, so it was taxes, the need to pay taxes to support infrastructure and employ labor that led to property being assigned, the, the land tenure. Well, uh, you also had uh, uh, the rulers had to keep accounts for all of this. How are we going to supply beer 
uh, and meat, you know, to the people who are working. And how, uh, how are we going to get stone and metal? Mesopotamia uh, was very rich agricultural land, uh, as was uh, the Nile Valley, but it was all river deposited. It was all deposited uh, by, by uh, water over the millions of years. Uh, where are they going to get stone and uh, uh, metal? They had to have foreign trade. So uh, you had uh, rulers uh, ha have accountants organize their society and they organized it. Well, uh, how, how are we going to make uh, a balance sheet of right? We have silver coming in and metals coming in from abroad. We have grain and barley uh, and uh, wool uh, uh, from uh, domestically. So they, they created uh, a uh, money as a accounting system, a means of payment. And uh, they, they set one uh, uh, unit of uh, grain, a bushel of grain was equal to one shekel of silver. So that you could keep foreign trade and domestic agriculture all in one set of unified accounts. Uh, and money was a byproduct of accounting. Uh, and uh, again, you, you had uh, a whole uh, uh, 100 years of misinformation about money, uh, about essentially written by uh, uh, pro-bankers and uh, uh, Austrians and uh, academics uh, that uh, said, well, money must have developed when people uh, wanted to uh, create uh, 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 to barter. Well, that's not how money was created. It had nothing to do with barter at all. Uh, it, what we found is that uh, the origins of enterprise were coordinated by the chieftains or by the rulers or whatever you would call the chieftains and, or rulers in a given uh, uh, society. And uh, the chieftains uh, in every society, African tribal societies and uh, Asian societies, the chieftain was in charge of foreign trade. And so the, the uh, rulers were in charge of uh, the foreign trade. Uh, they would have private, they were mixed economies. They would have private uh, entrepreneurs uh, doing, uh, traveling abroad, and uh, they would be uh, either borrow money from each other or from the palace. Uh, they'd have to pay taxes uh, to the palace uh, tariffs. Uh, and uh, you'd have uh, the people uh, on the land and you'd have basically an integrated economy being uh, uh, coordinated. Well, as you can, uh, and money wasn't used at all for barter. Uh, and you can understand why. Uh, the major uh, domestic money was grain. Well, just imagine you're during the crop year, you have a whole year in between uh, harvests or whatever the harvest period is. Uh, nobody's going to carry around a little grain in their pocket and uh, weigh it out. Uh, the scales weren't uh, all that good at any rate. So during the crop year, what we found, uh, and all of this was from the Assyriological records, from the cuneiform documents that were engraved on clay. And uh, basically, uh, we found them from garbage uh, piles of people who just threw out all the documents and you dig them all up and you'd get the whole records, uh, the archives of a particular family. You'd have uh, the public records. Uh, well, during the year, you'd, you'd go to the ale house uh, and uh, you'd run ale and you'd do what uh, workers do in the West between paydays. They'd uh, run up a tab on the bar. They'd run up a tab and the whole idea was on payday, you would uh, be uh, have to settle your bill, pay the tab. Well, in uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt, uh, the only time that you would actually pay for all of these things that you'd consume during the year, uh, rent of animals, uh, maybe plows, uh, uh, shoes, uh, uh, whatever, whatever. Uh, all of, uh, we have the contracts for the IOUs that the uh, people would sign. And the, uh, every contract would say, the, uh, this uh, uh, in exchange for what you bought, uh, the debt will be paid on the threshing floor uh, at harvest time. So the uh, Sumerians and the Babylonians and the Egyptians uh, would bring in their uh, grain or their crops to be weighed out. And then uh, the first thing that would happen was they would uh, 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 say, okay, this much goes to the ale lady, this much goes to the palace in exchange for what it's advanced, this much goes to the uh, uh, to the palace who rented out land to me as a sharecropper, uh, and they, they'd pay all the debts. So money was used 
once a year or once a harvest season, uh, essentially, to uh, settle, settle the debts. Uh, ancient societies operated on credit, not money. So the whole idea of uh, the Austrian idea uh, was wrong. And the reason the Austrians idea was wrongheaded was uh, there was a basic, uh, not only a dishonesty, but a vicious hatred of democracy by the Austrian school and by economic, uh, academic economics. And their hatred of democracy was the fear that a democracy might take control of uh, a government and uh, apply pro-labor po uh, policies that interfered with the profits of banks and the profits of the rich people. And so the Austrian school developed a whole theory of economics. Today, it's uh, the Chicago school, junk economics, uh, the monetarism. How do we create an economic theory where government doesn't exist? And if we can say that the whole economy works without government existing, except to interfere, then uh, uh, we, can, we can block democracy. We can prevent any government from actually doing anything. That's the ideal of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party of the United States today. It's the neoliberal idea today is essentially to circumscribe governments so, uh, so that instead of the governments creating money or instead of the governments regulating debt, uh, the bankers, the financial sector will be in control is the honest sector. Well, you can see why this wouldn't uh, and this idea is said, well, this is must have been how civilization began back in Mesopotamia and Egypt in the third millennium BC, second millennium BC. Well, we know that that didn't exist because I've just said what was the norm in uh, you know how you you pay the debts out of your crops and you had the idea of you know more or less stable society. But as you all know, crops fail sometimes. Sometimes there's bad weather. What do you do when the crops fail? Or what do you do if there's a disease and people get sick? What do you do with families that uh, somebody's injured uh, somehow, uh, or, or uh, they, they can't pay the debts? But may, or if there's a military hostility, if there's war, uh, an, uh, uh, your opponents come in, they burn the land, they destroy the crops. Uh, what do you do in that case? Well, the ruler could, could do one of two things. If he did not cancel the debts, if he said, oh, I'm sorry, there was a crop surplus, Gee, and you've pledged your uh, land to the creditor. Now you're going to lose the land. Oh, and you've, you've pledged your, uh, uh, your slave uh, to the creditor is uh, collateral. And oh, your wife and daughter, you've also pledged as collateral to the debt. Well, if, if the ruler didn't cancel the debt, then half the population would lose its land uh, and the families would be broken up and uh, the creditors would end up pretty quickly with uh, all the land and uh, all of the, uh, uh, the population. And uh, the creditors tend to uh, get powerful enough that they don't pay their debts. Uh, they, they can resist the government uh, and they can in fact become a rival to the palace. And the palace, the last thing the palace wanted in Babylonia, all the way down to the Byzantine empire was to have an independent creditor class that would end up hiring its own army, overthrowing uh, uh, the government and establishing a Chicago school, essentially Pinochet type uh, uh, revolution uh, uh, taking over. So uh, the rulers cancel the debts. And uh, you uh, it turns out that uh, while, for instance, everybody knew back in the 1980s about Hammurabi's laws, uh, and they thought, oh, here's the law code. Well, it wasn't a law code because we have the actual uh, court documents of many cases and uh, the judges didn't follow uh, Hammurabi's laws. Uh, there were guidelines. It was a literary thing. The only uh, proclamations of Hammurabi that actually had legal, legally binding force were the debt cancellation, the Andararam laws. Uh, and essentially, they, uh, what, the idea was, uh, you're going to have a disruption in activity. How do we get back to normal? How do we restore resilience? Just like today, uh, when we're in a pandemic right now, uh, economic activity is disrupted. There are a lot of arrears that are mounting, rent arrears, debt arrears. Uh, how are we going to handle that? Uh, Babylonia and Sumer uh, are examples. Well, it, it, uh, if you don't say, okay, the, the debts don't have to be paid, 
we're going to start all over in economy and balance. So uh, the one thing uh, that we looked at the training uh, manuals for uh, the scribes. The mathematical models used by ba Babylonian scribes are more sophisticated than any mathematical model used anywhere in the world today because they saw something very simple. They calculated how fast the debts grow. Compound interest. We have all of their compound interest. How fast do herds of cattle grow when the economy grows? Just like today, it grows in an S curve. Well, you know that if the economy grows in an S curve and the other is compound interest, that uh, there's going to be again and again and again, the volume of debt is going to grow faster than the, uh, 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 the ability to pay. And either you're going to have the whole society uh, end up uh, owned by the creditors, or you're going to have the rulers restore balance uh, and the economy is not self-regulating. Uh, every economic student today has said uh, the business, there's a business cycle uh, and the business cycle is self-regulating uh, uh, and if, if things go, uh, unemployment goes down or there's a crash, it'll all automatically go back to normal without the government doing anything. Uh, that's not what they believed in uh, uh, the Bronze Age. They knew that the government had to intervene uh, and restore order. And uh, the uh, Sumerian word for this, amargi, was restoring the mother condition. That, in other words, restoring normalcy. So there was the whole. There was a theory of time and uh, that underlay uh, uh, the the Bronze Age before classical antiquity. A circular time. It was always you had to go back to normal. Everything had to be put back in order, uh, uh, just uh, uh, to create to to free economies from. Uh, the disruption that you'd have when there's a crop failure, or even if there was no crop failure, even if there was no military uh, invasion, when a new ruler took power, you, you were pretty sure that during that period of uh, the former king's rule, uh, debts were going to mount up. Well, what, what we found very quickly was uh, that the uh, uh, Babylonian uh, underarm laws uh, were uh, taken over word for word uh, in the Bible. In the, Jew, in the Jubilee year. And the word, the Hebrew word that they used was drur, uh, uh, D-R-R, which was cognate to the Babylonian word underarum. So it became pretty apparent that when the, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Jew, Judea had lost uh, the war with Babylonia, uh, the, uh, the wealthiest families and some of the rest of the population were uh, taken as hostage, it was taken uh, to Babylonia, and uh, they became acclimatized over a period of a century or so, uh, and became part of Babylonian society. But uh, then uh, when uh, Iran, uh, Persia, uh, conquered uh, Babylonia, uh, King Cyrus uh, let uh, uh, Nehemiah uh, resettle. A lot of the, uh, uh, the exiles wanted to go back to their homeland. Uh, and uh, so they, they went back and many of the people who wanted to go back most of all were the wealthiest families and they wanted to go back to uh, Judea and say, now we want our ancient land uh, that uh, was all uh, redistributed uh, to the poor and uh, to the rest of the people. So they brought with them this concept of the Jubilee year uh, of uh, restoring order and restoring order was to restore to them their land. And when the Bible was sort of Re was edited and composed in the 6th and 5th century BC, uh, you had this jubilee year written in to the whole narrative of the Bible, put at the very center of Mosaic law in Leviticus uh, book 25, and uh, uh, woven into the history of the kings, woven into the prophets. So you had uh, all of uh, uh, the Jewish Bible written uh, to weave in this concept of uh, underarm drawer of, re of jubilee of restoring uh, order. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, you had uh, this developed, uh, there was a whole sect uh, based on uh, 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 Milky Zadok, uh, one of the high priests. There were, uh, there was, uh, you had uh, debt as you went from the sixth century to the first century BC, 
uh, there weren't many records because uh, uh, the Judeans didn't keep their records on clay tablets. Uh, they kept them on parchment and we, we don't have any of them. All we have is what has survived uh, in the caves uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that there were midrashes, that is quotations of all of the things in the Bible that was uh, 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 tracing, uh, all putting all the debt cancellations all together. Well, uh, Jesus was part of this movement. And uh, in his uh, very first sermon, when he went uh, to the temple uh, in his home city and uh, delivered the first sermon, he unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and said, you know, I've come to proclaim the year of the Lord, the Jubilee year, to cancel the debts. And obviously in the five centuries that had followed the uh, initial compilation of the Bible, uh, there were more and more the, uh, wealthy people becoming uh, uh, rich in uh, Judea, just as they were in Greece and Rome and every other country. Every country of a classical antiquity in those centuries was polarizing between creditors at the top, uh, exploiting uh, debtors at the bottom, uh, enslaving much of the population. And the whole issue was, wait a minute, what about this Jubilee year in the Bible? You're supposed to liberate the slaves and you're not liberating them. You're supposed to return the lands and you're gobbling up the land. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus said that he'd come to, uh, uh, to can represent the conservative uh, liter uh, biblical uh, reform against the, uh, the, the wealthy people who were, uh, who Luke, uh, one of the uh, uh, four uh, 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 apostles, uh, the, the four books of the Bible uh, said uh, they, were, they were the Pharisees. Uh, these were the rabbinical group that ended up being led by uh, Rabbi Hillel, uh, who uh, uh, had uh, developed uh, a clause that also had been used in Babylonia. When borrowers would borrow, they'd say, we waive our rights under the clean, under the Jubilee year. Well, already in Babylonia, uh, 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 creditors had got borrowers to say, we uh, waive our rights in case the ruler should cancel the debts. The ruler and the court said, all these clauses are illegal. You know, uh, the debts are, <laughs> uh, are canceled. But uh, that is not what happened in Israel. Uh, uh, the uh, rabbis got the, uh, uh, the waiver uh, to be uh, signed. And so you, you had uh, in, uh, in uh, Judea, uh, the same kind of a class fight that uh, you were having much more uh, in Greece and Rome. Am I moving too fast for you? No, not at, all, not at all, not at all. You, you're okay. doing fine. What okay. I see is that you're talking about the same same uh, 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 power struggle between creditors and debtors all the time. Actually, that's what you're saying between government and financial elites. It well, seems like, it seems like it's a it's a pattern all over the place. I mean, if you take your experience from the from the Latin American things, uh, your experience from Canada, uh, from your payments uh, balance and payments analysis that you made. And then we go back all the way to Sumer and Babylonia, and then back to, to Judea with Jesus. It seems like it's the same, same thing all over again, all the time. Well, it is a common thread throughout history. Either that or I have a tunnel vision. Uh, I think it's a, a common thread throughout history. Uh, the question is, how did, how did the West come to be so different from all this? Why, don't we, why today don't we cancel the debts? Well, the answer is found in Greece and Rome. And uh, I, uh, I'd been doing uh, lecturing at the in uh, Institute of Fine Arts and part of NYU in uh, New York, uh, uh, teaching a course in Greece from the uh, 10th to 8th century uh, BC, G Greek archaeology. And uh, there was a meeting in 1990 uh, about uh, uh, this whole period. And uh, I gave uh, almost all the lectures on archaeology at that uh, were all about pottery or uh, designs or ships. Uh, there was nothing about way social practices. Uh, how, because there are no social records about social practices. That's why it was the dark age, uh, yeah. being dark, literally dark. And I thought uh, I'd uh, worked with uh, uh, Linear B, uh, the, the Bronze Age in Greece, uh, uh, the second millennium BC, we have uh, all the Linear B uh, records uh, of the palaces, uh, Knossos and, uh, and Crete and Greece, and no records anywhere of, it, of 
interest being charged. Uh, you would have, uh, uh, here's how much is owed to us from each different section, but no, no idea of interest. And so I realized my theory, and it's now been become the accepted theory, is that uh, interest uh, was uh, brought to Greece and Rome by Phoenician, meaning Syrian, uh, traders around uh, 750 BC. And they, uh, they were trading, they brought the whole practice of charging interest. Uh, and uh, you can see how each uh, low, uh, they would trade with presumably the chieftains or the wealthy families and uh, uh, the Aegean in, in the Greek uh, city states, in, the, in Italy, Rome, and, its, uh, other, and the other city states. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, how, how are you going to calculate the rate at which interest builds up? Well, I figured out that the rate of interest in uh, Babylonia was uh, 1 60th per month because the Babylonian system was based on 60th because you could divide it into uh, uh, 12s, you could divide it very, very easily into, into fractions. Uh, and 60 months is five years. So uh, the doubling time of a loan in uh, uh, Babylonia and the whole Near East was five years. Well, uh, the, the uh, Cretans and Egyptians used uh, a decimal system. So uh, they, their rate of interest was one tenth, but Rome used the duodecimal system, twelfths. It divided just as you have the troy ounce, troy pound, divided into 12 troy ounces, uh, you had 12. So the rate of interest in Greece, Rome, uh, uh, Babylonia, in every country, the rate of interest was the local fractional system. And so we realized that what was born, you had the whole argument that uh, Aristotle later developed, how, how can interest be charged if money's a barren metal? What's born? And uh, you have, again, the Austrian school, uh, the uh, anti-socialist, uh, a uh, far right wing uh, extremists say, well, uh, the uh, creditors must have always been the good guys, because if you say that creditors are the bad guys, then you have an argument against today's bankers. So uh, the uh, creditors must have lent out cattle and uh, they must have lent out grain and took part of their uh, return in the form of grain and cattle. Well, no anthropologist has found any society anywhere in the world at any time where people lend out cattle. Uh, they, uh, creditors will foreclose on cattle, but they won't, le uh, they won't lend them out. They take them, not, uh, uh, not uh, lend them. And we realized that what was born was not cattle. It wasn't crops growing. It was time. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, one twelfth uh, interest, well, that means you pay 1% a month. That's uh, and, uh, essentially you... Uh, 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 or one twelfth of the principal, which is eight and a third percent a month. You had every uh, rate of interest re based on, on the time and the debts were always owed uh, uh, on, in Greece it was on the new moon. Uh, and so when, uh, when you have uh, the moon, you have, okay, new period, uh, the debts are due. Uh, you had the whole timing of paying debt. But what you had was, uh, you had the rate of interest being charged, but you didn't have any kings in Greece and Rome. They, uh, Rome overthrew the kings uh, that were reported by Livy and uh, other historians to have been uh, kept a, a pretty good balance and kept the creditors in check. Uh, uh, same thing uh, in Greece. You, you didn't have, uh, in most countries, uh, areas, you didn't have the kings. They were sort of more like the mafia in, the, uh, in uh, Greece coming out of the dark ages in the eighth and seventh centuries BC. Uh, they were overthrown by uh, popular, uh, uh, overthrown by uh, people called tyrants who actually were the people who uh, laid the seeds for democracy in Corinth, uh, 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 other countries. Uh, and they, the first thing they would, they would redistribute the land that had been monopolized by the local mafiosi, the kings, uh, or, uh, and they'd cancel the debts. Well, in Athens in uh, 507 BC, Solon canceled the debts. He didn't redistribute the land, uh, uh, but subsequent tyrants, uh, Pisistratus became uh, the, the great catalysts for democracy uh, in these countries. So, but still you had from the very beginning uh, without kings to cancel the debts, you had 
an oligarchy uh, developing throughout the whole ancient world, but especially in Greece and especially uh, in Rome. And Aristotle wrote that the constitutions of many cities uh, seemed to be democratic, but actually they were oligarchic. And both he and Plato described uh, demo if you do have a democracy, you're going to have wealthy people developing, they're going to take over, and uh, uh, the, uh, the democracy is going to turn into an oligarchy, and the oligarchy is going to make itself uh, hereditary into an aristocracy, and it's going to uh, essentially uh, stifle uh, economic growth, grab all the wealth and all the land for itself until so, someone among the ruling families is going to fight against the other ruling families because there's no one else to fight against, and they're going to take the people into their camp, that was uh, Aristotle's phrase, uh, and uh, uh, have a, a revolution and have democracy all over again. So it was like an eternal triangle, democracy, uh, oligarchy, aristocracy, overthrowing it with a new democracy, and the whole cycle begins all over again. Uh, and that's pretty much how Greek uh, uh, history seemed to be developing. Uh, in Rome, uh, you had an oligarchy ruling from the very beginning. The kings were overthrown, and the oligarchies are pretty much in control uh, from the fifth century, uh, end of the sixth century onward. And uh, what you had was uh, five centuries of repeated revolts, walkouts, secessions of the plebs, civil war, and uh, essentially war, oh, the common uh, demand of all of the uh, rebels was cancel the debts, redistribute the land. Well, they were all killed. Uh, the, the Romans believed in the kind of free market that uh, the University of Chicago free market is believed in. They said, we can't have a free market if you don't assassinate everybody who wants to challenge our power. Freedom, liberty for us is the liberty to enslave our debtors. Liberty for us is the ability to do what we want to other people. That was a free market as the Romans defined. And of course, that's Milton Friedman's free market and what uh, libertarian economics is all about. Uh, freedom for the wealthy, uh, what they call the free market is a market dominated by the creditors, dominated by uh, the monopolists and by the rentiers. It, and Rome was a rentier society. So uh, they, they killed uh, one popular leader after another, uh, ending with uh, the stabbing of Julius Caesar when they were worried that he was going to cancel the debts to uh, uh, resol uh, resolve the debt crisis uh, that had already occurred a generation before in the Catiline uh, cult conspiracy when Catiline tried to uh, fight to cancel the debts uh, as his predecessors uh, had tried to do. So Rome uh, be uh, became really the first society not to cancel the debts. And we all know what happened to that. Uh, we had the Dark Age. And the Dark Age is what happens when you let creditors take control. The Dark Age is what happens when uh, you let uh, the free marketers gain control and uh, essentially use debt as a lever to grabbing all of the land, all the property, to create monopolies, uh, and essentially to take power away from the government. And so when you have the libertarians say, we want to get rid of government power so that they, government planning is, is awful, look at what Stalin did with it. Uh, the fact is that every economy plans ahead. Uh, since the Neolithic, you have to plan ahead to plant. Uh, every uh, company plans ahead to research and development. If the government doesn't uh, take the lead in doing the planning and uh, indicative planning and regulation, then planning and regulation and research allocation shifts to the creditors, to the banks. And that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing uh, uh, the takeover of the banks uh, and the creditors. And you can see this happening again and again in uh, medieval Europe. Uh, what Rome, uh, what survived from the dark age uh, uh, after the Roman economy collapsed uh, and survived mainly in Byzantium uh, the Byzantine Empire, which did have more or less regular debt cancellations, uh, being fairly near Eastern at that time. Uh, you had Western Europe uh, is a kind of barbarian uh, backwater, uh, much as it's becoming today, uh, once again. Uh, and uh, what put it in motion was the looting of Constant uh, Constantinople, uh, funded by uh, the Venetians and by the Crusades. Uh, the, uh, uh, the 
Pope uh, mounted a, a crusade uh, to the, the Holy Land, but uh, uh, Venice uh, put up uh, money to fund an army to loot Constantinople and in exchange for one quarter of all of the loot uh, that they could have. And essentially that uh, Constantinople had been the one thing protecting Europe uh, from uh, uh, the hordes from the east, from uh, uh, the Huns, from uh, the Turks, from uh, all sorts of uh, invading uh, crowds. So you, you, you had all of a sudden all of this money pouring into the, uh, into the uh, uh, Christian societies uh, from Italy all the way uh, to England. And uh, with uh, money, you had commerce. Well, how are you going to develop commerce without credit? Well, you had the schoolmen, the, the theologians said, uh, well, there must be some way that we can permit interest, which uh, Christianity abandoned. Uh, 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 things got so bad in the Roman Empire that the Christians went to the extreme of banning interest outright uh, and thinking, well, if, in, if uh, interest is the problem that is uh, uh, causing everybody to lose their land, lose, fall into bondage, we'll just pay an interest. Well, uh, the theologian said, well, you need interest for credit. So they said, okay, we're not going to permit interest on debts, but we will permit uh, foreign exchange bankers to do foreign exchange trading so that they can send money from England to uh, 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 the kings and the nobility that are on the crusades so that if they put money in, in London, or they need money uh, while they're on the crusades to outfit themselves and to buy food or whatever, you know, they can lend against the land. So uh, all of a sudden you had the main, uh, uh, the main borrowers were not the poor peasants losing the land, they were the rich nobles. And uh, the, the people they were borrowing from weren't uh, 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 civilian uh, creditors, they were the church, the main church orders themselves, the Templars, the Knights Templar, and also the hospitalers. Uh, and they developed, uh, we have the uh, loan agreements that they've all grown up and they're, they're just as difficult as if you go to a bank today and you sign an IOU for a credit card or for a bank loan, you had all the different clauses for what you have to repay. And uh, you had debt coming back into uh, 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 Europe, essentially at the top of the pyramids. Uh, you, the main bar there was borrowing from uh, Italian bankers and the borrowing is by the kings. It wasn't so much by the poor. Uh, uh, the, the poor could only borrow from uh, the Jews. They couldn't borrow from the Christians. Uh, only the rich people could borrow from the Christians uh, 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 bankers. And so uh, you, you would have kings borrowing to go to war uh, and you would have to borrow uh, because all wars are uh, fought with foreign exchange because the idea is you want to fight the war on foreign soil uh, and destroy their country, not on your own soil where your country is hurt. So silver, uh, and to a lesser extent gold, uh, was the form of money. Just as silver was the form of money uh, in antiquity, which is why the Spanish word for money, argent, argent uh, is uh, the word for silver. Argentina is uh, where the silver uh, 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 came from, named after that. So you had, you had the developing, again, of the uh, not only of uh, uh, credit, but also of bankruptcy. And uh, who was going to go bankrupt? Well, again, it was, uh, it was the kings who would go bankrupt in the realms. And uh, by the 13th century, you would have Matt Matthew Paris was an analyst who was writing about how uh, the, uh, London and England were being treated pretty much like the third world countries are treated today by the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> Uh, they, were, they were just looted by the Italian bankers that say, give us your mines, give us your forests, give us your land, uh, give us your money. Uh, and essentially the, uh, uh, the uh, kings outside of Italy became client oligarchies, client royalties, not even an oligarchy, client royalties to uh, the, uh, uh, the papal groups that were funding them uh, until finally in uh, uh, the French king uh, decided to put uh, the, to arrest all the Templars, kill them, uh, accuse them of devil worship, and grabbed all the money back. But all of the kings had, uh, in Europe, from Paris to London, the kings had kept uh, the royal treasury in uh, the the uh, the Templars, uh, the temp the temples, uh, just as in antiquity, uh, all the cities would keep their their uh, 
uh, savings in the in the temples and Babylonia, Sumer, the savings were always kept in the temples. Well, that was done uh, uh, in antiquity. Well, finally, uh, the temples were overthrown, and that paved that opened the path the, for the only creditors being Italians and uh, uh, then the Dutch, and you had others. You had the whole unfolding of uh, uh, European countries uh, again going to war again and again and again, going bankrupt. And as they would run up into debts that couldn't be paid again and again, more and more of the commons, the royal domain, the forests, the natural, the subsoil resources, the land were all forward for forfeited uh, or to creditors. And uh, when uh, government couldn't pay, they, uh, they would create a monopoly uh, to give to creditors. And most of the monopolies in infrastructure were all created in order to pay the debts. Uh, the easiest thing for governments to do was to pay debts by, okay, we're going to create an East and West Indies trading company. We're going to give a trading monopoly and we'll sell it off and then we'll take the proceeds and you have to pay for the debts in bonds. So we're going to retire our bonds, give us a given amount of bonds and we'll create a monopoly. Uh, that's the Russia company was created in England. The South Sea company was created. Uh, to pay debts. The Bank of England was created for 1.2 million pounds sterling paid for in British bonds. So all of the monopolies uh, that were created, the privatization of Europe uh, was largely a debt settlement for debts that couldn't be paid. Well, as you can imagine, the last, uh, as you fast forward today, we've been talking an hour already, the last thing that bankers want is for governments to create their own money. Because if governments can create their own money, like I wanted Canada to do, instead of borrowing from uh, Switzerland and Germany, then people won't have to borrow from the banks. Uh, and uh, the banks want the governments to balance their budget, not to create their own money, but to uh, essentially, instead of modern monetary theory, instead of just running a deficit by printing the money, they uh, borrow the money at interest from the banks and the financial class. Well, uh, the claim is that if uh, a government's print money, that's inflationary. But if you borrow the money from rich people, it's not inflationary. Well, this is the same argument that I've come across in Canada. And it's wrong because uh, if, if, you, the, if the government spends uh, more money, it's equally inflationary or non-inflationary. Whether it's uh, rich people say, here's, my, here's all my, my money and I'm lending it to you or I'm a banker and I'm creating it uh, on a balance sheet and I'm lending it to you, or if the government just prints the money, it's all the same. It doesn't matter where the money comes from, but uh, the pretense by the monetarists is that, uh, uh, that governments cannot uh, essentially create uh, their own money, uh, that government debt is bad, uh, only private debt is good. And private debt is good because if you have a private corporation uh, or a government going into debt to a private sector or an individual, the creditor ends up foreclosing on the collateral and the creditors get rich. So you have a mm -hmm. whole financial dynamic that has uh, defined money as what rich people have and are able to foreclose on. And uh, if governments can create their own money, they could also create the creditor rules. And they could say, wait a minute, if you've made a bad loan that can't be paid, like uh, it happened after 2008 uh, when the banks uh, made in America made uh, trillions of dollars of fraudulent, fraudulent loans, uh, in, uh, which were called junk mortgage loans. Uh, everybody knew it, the ninja to uh, no income, no jobs, no assets. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, whole, the whole idea was, of course, you're going to have forfeitures. Of course, you're going to have a foreclosure. Uh, uh, but you're, you're not going to want the government to come in and say, wait a minute, we're going to write down the debts to the real value. We're going to make it a, a, appear as if the bank, uh, what the banks only deserve the real value of the property. They don't deserve the fictitious values that they put on this property. This was criminal, as my uh, colleague at U, uh, University of Missouri at Kansas City, Bill Black, uh, has written. Uh, extensively. He's shown he was the prosecutor for the savings and loan frauds in the United States in the 1980s. And he found the frauds under the Obama administration uh, uh, and the bailout to be uh, uh, the, the worst frauds uh, in, in modern uh, financial history. Uh, and Obama was a spot of the protector 
uh, 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 of the frogs. He said, we're not going to, we're going to reward the criminals. We're, uh, we're going to let the banks foreclose on uh, the, uh, uh, on debtors that can't pay the fictitious loan values. Uh, we're going to, and we're going to uh, let uh, private Wall Street uh, firms buy up all their property. And uh, Obama's aim was to reduce home ownership rates in the country. And he slashed them by 10%, mainly among uh, the blacks and uh, black people and uh, uh, Hispanics, uh, the low income people who'd been redlined uh, and who'd had, who'd, uh, had uh, uh, themselves victimized uh, by the most uh, fraudulent loans. So uh, the, the free enterprise boys said, well, this is government interference. And Obama said, I believe in the free market. I'm not going to interfere with the banks, meaning I'm not going to interfere with the bank fraud. No banker will go to jail. Uh, but if the debtor can't pay, the debtor, of course, can uh, let him be thrown out in, uh, in the street. So you have the same uh, you, uh, situation today. Today, yeah, I mean, it seems like you know what you're describing actually is private debt is like a weapon of mass destruction for for society or for ordinary people. That's right, right. Uh, because and again, uh, uh, the compound interest. All you have to do is uh, if people leave the, uh, uh, the savings uh, uh, in the market or in the bond market or in the banks, they grow exponentially, but the mm -hmm. economy is not growing. Wages have not grown at all since 1980, but the volume of debt has gone up. So in every economy, you have the ratio of debt to income rising. You have the ratio of debt to the value of assets rising. Uh, the, uh, now, uh, 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 if you look at American real estate as a whole, most of the real estate is not held by the nominal homeowner or yeah. uh, commercial owner, it's the bank, the debt, is the largest chunk of the real estate value. So the whole economy is being absorbed uh, by this expansion uh, of debt. And uh, of course, that's uh, vastly increased uh, today uh, with the coronavirus. And, and yeah. that's where Babylonian uh, example comes in. Just a minute, uh, if you do not, right? If you do not say, uh, we're going to treat the, the whole year or two years of the virus is an interruption. Nobody's going to have to pay the debts. No one will have to pay the rent. Uh, the landlords won't have to pay their mortgage debt to the bank. We're just going to take a breather so that when it's all over, we can start afresh as things were before. Uh, I'm not even saying there should be a debt write down. You, you want to have resilience. The yeah, you just take you just you just take a holiday. I mean, I think you know, <laughs> I think you're talking to the right audience when you say that because if you want a holiday, you need it to be backed by the state. So you need state money in that case because because the state can you know it doesn't matter for them if they get the money or not because they can just uh, uh, spend it into existence anyway, right? Yep. So if we had the system where we we shortcut the 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 the, the private banks or the private financiers, there is no need to 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 pay in in a crisis you can you could just have a holiday on any payment without a problem actually it's easy to say that as an ideal and i think it's even stronger if you say what if you don't do that what if you make people pay uh there in uh, it's estimated that between five and ten million families are going to be evicted uh when right now in america there is a moratorium on rents uh renters do not have to pay uh, the landlords uh and, uh, uh, but at a certain point, this moratorium is going to end. Now, one of two things can happen. Either you say, okay, at the end of the moratorium, we're just gonna count, uh, uh, renters don't have to pay, the landlord doesn't have to pay, the, uh, and you don't have to pay the debts. We're just starting off of where we were when we were interrupted. But mm -hmm. if you make everybody pay, then you're gonna throw 10 million families out in the street just like Obama threw 10 million families out, but this is going to be uh, even worse. In New York City, there will be huge evictions. Presumably, they're all going to be uh, sleeping on the subways. Uh, the homeless shelters are already uh, full uh, in New York City. Uh, you're going to have just mass evictions. You're going to have uh, corporations uh, bankrupt. You're going to have uh, families uh, losing the money. You'll have land landlords uh, insolvent. And uh, uh, the... 
financial, uh, the stock market is soaring because they say, this is the best thing that's happened in half a century. We're going to get rich. It's easier to make money in a crisis than it is in growth. In a, uh, there are uh, large numbers of private capital funds that have been uh, created. And uh, the private capital funds are uh, saying, you know, we're, we're raising money, we're raising billions of dollars so that when the evictions come, we can all pick up commercial buildings, residential buildings, homes at a discount, uh, at a, a cheap price, and then we can turn them into rental properties. And what used to be an owner-occupied housing will now be rental housing, and we can uh, act to raise the rents. And uh, uh, essentially, we can we can recover what was overthrown in the 19th century. We can we can we can restore what happened in the medieval times. We yeah. can have a neo-feudal society. We, we, as, we can be money lords and we'll have the power that the landlords had over Europe for hundreds of years before democra democratic reform. All we have to do is stop democracy. And of course, that's where American uh, diplomacy comes in. Wow, it's, it's actually quite a strong picture you're painting. So my question gets here, when, I, when I'm thinking about it, can it be in coincidence that we have all the economic theories that we have, that we have laws, that we have like a, a, a beliefs that say, no, 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 the state need to go uh, or have a surplus all the time. Yeah, we have to borrow from private banks all the time. And, and, and also, if I look at it, I don't see that many who talks about the problem with private debt. It's you and Steve Keynes, actually, and a few more, but not that many. But I don't see any like a, a big name economists. I, I don't see that in any papers. Is there any reason for it? What do you think? Uh, the economic discipline has been turned into a propaganda discipline. Uh, there's been enormous amount of money to subsidize business schools, think tanks, right wing organizations. Uh, the Koch brothers, have, uh, uh, who have over $50 bill billion, have uh, funded all sorts of right wing uh, uh, institutes. Uh, uh, lobbying organizations, they call them think tanks, but they're propaganda tanks. Uh, and uh, in, when I went to school uh, 60 years ago, we, they still taught the history of economic thought. We still learned classical economics about rent, economic rent being unearned income uh, as opposed uh, to profits. Uh, but you've had uh, the lobbyists essentially uh, strip away. You no longer have in America uh, the history of economic thought is a core curriculum topic. You don't have economic history is a core curriculum topic. It's, it's, uh, it's as if it should be taught in the humanities department as uh, literature is science fiction. It's a parallel universe. So how are you going to get students who uh, study econ economics and uh, enter this parallel universe? Well, it helps to be autistic. It helps not to have a reality sense. It helps to be someone like Paul Krugman you know, who lives in a kind of, uh, if you assume this, then this will happen. Uh, and these are the people who get the Nobel Prizes. The Nobel Prize is essentially a public relations organization for uh, the bankers to fight uh, against uh, 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 democracy, against classical economics, to say that it's quite right that uh, all economic power should be centralized in a small uh, class, and we're going to give Nobel Prizes and say, if you don't say that the rich people should uh, take uh, over society instead of government, then that's not science. What we say is science because we're giving the Nobel Prize for it and we get to judge. So yeah. essentially, they've corrupted the judgment process. The, the acad academia has been corrupted, and even the statistics have been corrupted. They have redefined gross national product, gross domestic product, again and again, to uh, instead of treating interest and, uh, and uh, fees as a transfer payments is a cost, they treat it as output. So in the United States, interest rates on credit cards are maybe 11%, but uh, the penalty fees are 29%. The penalty fees are not treated as interest in the accounts. They're treated as, uh, uh, as financial service. So the banks are providing you a service uh, that is worth the uh, margin between 29% and 11% uh, or whatever. Uh, and it's actually a contribution to GDP. The reason GDP is going up so much in America is there are so many foreclosures. There's so many uh, debt for, uh, for, uh, foreclosures. If you're in a home and the home price is being bid up 
uh, because of the uh, 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 monopolization of uh, land, the, uh, the increase in the homeowner's value uh, of what the homeowner would have to pay himself or herself if they rented uh, their, to themselves, that's, that's 7% of GDP right there. So you right. have the whole concept of economic output, the whole picture of economies has been uh, redesigned by the bankers to make themselves look as if the parasite is creating all of the nourishment for the host. It's mm -hmm. as if the parasite is uh, actually doing all of the productive work by charging penalty fees, by uh, uh, charging interest, by uh, m making monopoly uh, profits. Uh, you, you have the world turned inside out. Uh, and you, uh, I don't think you can reform a uh, discipline that has been sort of taken over as public relations for the banking sector. You really have to create a, a new discipline. I'm not, uh, I call it archaeology. I mean, it could be anthropology. It could, I don't, you, you could call it reality economics. Uh, actually, uh, we, uh, I worked with uh, Herman Kahn and Alvin Toffler in the 70s. Uh, we called, we decided to call it future, futurist, futurology or futurism, because that sort of shifts the whole, you have, you have to create a clean, a new beginning. And the new beginning, uh, uh, it actually, what, what would the cur curriculum be? We teach classical economics. We teach uh, Adam Smith, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, everybody who define value theory. The difference yeah. between value and price is economic rent, this unearned income. You've got to restore the concept that not all income is earned. Some income is a transfer payment. It's, it's parasitic. You've got to restore that concept. You've got to make a realistic economic model that looks at that, that here's how much the debts are growing here's the ability to pay what you you're going to have to write down the debts or else you're going to end up looking like greece uh, looked a few years ago or argentina's looking today and yeah. if you don't and that's going to be our future if you don't have a reality economics uh, replacing this uh junk economics that's uh, paid for by the right-wing lobbyists yeah it's, uh, I was just thinking, you know, that we, uh, we are sitting in the epicenter of what you talked about now, because uh, uh, we are in Sweden, in Stockholm, you know, so Riksbank and, you know, the Nobel Prize is, is, <laughs> is from here. <laughs> so maybe we should invite uh, someone from there to have a discussion with you later on, actually. It would be quite fun to see that, you know, what, what, what is it that makes them to award a Nobel Prize in economics, you know? Based, based, based on what, what criteria? That would be quite fun, actually. <laughs> the last thing they would ever agree to is a discussion. A few years ago, uh, uh, Paul Krugman, one of the uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, was, he thought, well, I've got to talk to somebody uh, who doesn't agree with me. And he, picked, he thought, Here's, he found a guy from Australia. Then nobody's heard of him, Steve Kane. And uh, so he had a debate, and you can find it on, uh, uh, on Google. Uh, with Steve Kane, and it was like Bambi meets Goliath. Uh, uh, Krugman is the lobbyist for the banks, uh, ultra right winger, uh, saying that banks cannot create money. All banks do is act like savings banks. They relend the loans from savers to uh, borrowers, but they don't create credit at all. Well, Steve Kane showed that when you go into a bank, uh, the banker doesn't say, "Well, let me see how much money we have to lend you." The banker, you know, said, okay, we'll just uh, write out an IOU and uh, you'll sign the IOU. We'll, we'll create a, a deposit. It's the loan that creates the deposit, not the deposit that creates the loan. And so, uh, I mean, Steve Kane made uh, uh, Krugman look like uh, the, the idiot savant uh, that he is. Uh, there's no way they're going to talk about any realistic person because the fact is they're basically the neo-fascists. Uh, they, they want to get rid of democratic government, the centralized control in the hands of the banks. Uh, they, uh, they have a fictitious, they can only do this by making a fictitious view of an economy that doesn't exist. But anyone who brings in the reality, here are the statistics, the reality yeah. of economic history, they, they say that's not economics, that's Exogenous. They actually have a vocabulary. Exogenous means external to our models. That means, oh, that's politics. 
we don't discuss politics. And mm. once they off the stage came, they said, oh, I'm so sorry, that's reality. That's not what we're talking about. Economics is not about reality. Economics is a story about how the world would work if the rich people controlled uh, the government and uh, ran markets in a way that worked. Well, of course, that's utterly fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. well, how would banks be if they weren't crooks? Well, OK, that you can think how there might be some planet uh, where uh, it's ruled that way. But uh, let's talk about the real world. Well, they, oh, reality is not part of our models. Yeah. Now, they, they have a problem in the, with the uh, empirical things, actually. Because, because the results, if you look at the numbers, shows quite clearly what's happening everywhere. Okay, and it's even if you look at Steve Keen's numbers, you can see that you know when he modeled Minsky and we look at uh, look at history, he can you know you can see what happens with private debt when it goes over certain numbers, and then you have a crash, and then you have fire sales, and then somebody buys this, the stuff cheap, and then it starts all starts all over again. So you know, it's quite clear, Not, the numbers are very clear. There's no doubt about it, no. Michael, I was thinking that was really, really a lot to, to take in. I'm happy that we recorded this. We're gonna do a transcript, but would you be up to take a few questions from the audience? Would you mind that? Sure. So if, if uh, people in the audience just would like to raise their hand and then we can unmute you and you can ask Michael a question if there's any takers. And thanks a lot for all of that, Michael. I need to come back to you. I, I need to come back to you with quite a lot of different things later on. <laughs> you probably have to unmute them if you want to take. Yeah, a yeah, I, I, I will. Uh, let me see now. So, Lotte, if you could start. Yes, I would like to because I'm thinking very much about uh, uh, we're talking about uh, sharing economy and um, circulating economy and everything. But what I can see is that uh, nobody owns uh, anything anymore, but they have to pay each month to to use things like music, Spotify, and all these kind of things. Uh, and what's going to happen? I think it's uh, it's a kind of slavery, in, and we're in depth, deep depth. Because uh, when we can't pay anymore, we're soon in that situation. Then we can't have anything of this. Music will uh, disappear. Uh, we cannot c communicate in the internet. We cannot uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> so. Uh, what do you think about um, what's the solution to do more than talking? Well, you're going to have to withdraw from the European community to begin with. Yeah. Uh, right. Right yeah. now, Sweden is uh, Sweden is governed by uh, Europe is governed is part of NATO. Uh, Europe is governed by a small office in the the bottom of the Pentagon, uh, and uh, one of the things that America wants to do is. Uh, it wants to make sure that uh, we're still on the problem we had when I was uh, analyzing the Vietnam War. How does it, uh, America pay for all of the military bases all over the world? It pays just by writing uh, uh, treasury debt. Essentially, Europe funds America's military. Uh, from America's, the vantage point of American diplomacy, uh, and I'm answering your question because I'm framing it. Uh, uh, Europe uh, uh, has to conduct its money with US dollars. It's uh, part when uh, the Americans designed the Euro uh, at the University of Chicago, again, is it the root of all evil. Uh, the Euro, uh, can, uh, Europe is, no European country is any longer what uh, political textbooks define as a state. A state has the ability to issue money and to uh, do its own taxes uh, have, and uh, uh, to declare war. No European country has uh, any of these rights. Uh, the Euro, uh, you're not, uh, part of the rules of the Eurozone is you cannot run uh, a budget deficit of more than 3%. The, the intention of the US who designed this is if, uh, if the Eurozone cannot run into debt, then they're not going to be Euro bonds for other countries to hold their international reserves in. And the only thing that they can hold their reserves in will be US dollars, which are the monetization of America's military uh, bases and military 
activities all over the world. A dollar is the embodiment of America's military spending, and they don't want uh, any European government to be able to create its own money to either pull it out of depression or to say, okay, uh, here we are in Italy or Sweden, and there are people who can't pay the debt, so we're going to just uh, create the money uh, to save, uh, save the banks. Uh, we, uh, or if the banks do go under, we'll have a public bank uh, that will essentially uh, insure all of the de uh, depositors up to whatever their insured amount is, but we're going to uh, use our money to uh, be able to finance how our economy gets by when people are not going to work, when companies are not functioning, when uh, we're not getting uh, the flow of income, the government is going to provide the money uh, in order uh, to get it by. Well, uh, it, uh, uh, a real uh, state would be able to do that, but uh, that's uh, been banned under uh, the monetary rules because they say, no, no, that's government debt. Uh, if you uh, need money to get by, you have to borrow from the commercial banks. And uh, if you lose your home, uh, that's just too bad. Uh, if you lose your property, you lose your savings. Well, that's how the free market works. So uh, somehow they've, they've tricked uh, uh, the Europeans into believing that that's a free market. And it's uh, the way to debt peonage. It's not freedom, it's debt peonage. Uh, they've, they've used an Orwellian rhetoric uh, to make debt uh, peonage seem like freedom from government, ability to create its own money to save you from uh, falling into debt and losing your home and losing your job and uh, becoming impoverished. Uh, we have a Swedish guy here. Uh, he's called Carl Gustafsson and he wrote a book about changing from uh, speculation economy to uh, time economy, that uh, you should uh, change the whole system to that you're paying, uh, uh, everybody's paying exactly the same amount of uh, hours uh, they have worked according to what you have uh, uh, get. So then there will be no um, opportunity to, uh, because there's a lot of tax planning, you know, so who's uh, lifting money from the poor, the rich all the time. But in this system, there wouldn't be any uh, holes. <laughs> Have you well, heard that the economy? All the money is made in speculation. Come on. If you, if you don't have a speculation economy, then GDP won't be going up so much. Uh, uh, and the economy uh -huh. won't polarize. The, 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 a speculation economy has two great benefits. Number one, it creates a lot of wealth. Number two, this wealth is sucked up by the 1% from the 99%. So the advantage of a specula speculation economy is it impoverishes the 99%. That's what the aim, that's the business plan of the banks. And if you get rid of the speculative economy, then there goes the bank's business plan. And, but, and, uh, and they're the people who are financing the government because they've privatized the government along with uh, much of the infrastructure. Okay, okay. Th thanks a lot. Do we need to go to the next person? Thanks a lot for your questions, Lotte. And I've, this time it will be uh, Joel, Joel Polito. Hi, Michael. That was a sensational presentation, as always. Uh, it's just a wonderful experience. I'm so glad they're recording it. We'll be able to share it. Um, I want to ask you about central bank digital currency. In Toronto, Canada tomorrow, they're having a discussion about it. Uh, and there's a proposal of, a, of an introduction of it where it would replace just pocketbook money to begin with. Um, and there have been other presentations uh, there's this Bank of Spanish, uh, Spain paper that talks about um, uh, having 100% money, really, in terms of central bank digital currency. Uh, do you see those developments as a potential to uh, uh, reduce economic rent in the banking system and giving the people more opportunity to uh, spend money on the real priorities that you've outlined and make it a really productive economy and uh, not a speck of a bland uh, inflation economy and so forth. I, I don't see the connection. I have to admit that I'm a techno peasant. Uh, in the 60s, I did have to do my own programming. And I, I was the, the link between Chase's economics department and the computer department. And I, I got so burned out doing uh, computer programming that I've developed a phobia for anything that has to do with computer 
a computerized thing uh, like uh, uh, electronic uh, funding. It's, it seems to me it's, if it's simply a form of account keeping, uh, then uh, I don't see what difference it makes. Uh, if it's money creation, I think there are many ways of money, money, money creation. Obviously, money is created on computers, uh, but it, uh, it all depends. Uh, I, I want to stay away from cryptocurrencies, uh, especially cryptocurrencies uh, that use an enormous amount of energy, where uh, all of the energy in the world is going to be doing Bitcoin or uh, cryptocurrency stuff. It, it's, it's, it's not my field. I, uh, I can I, talk about I, I'll send up. I'll put the link to the Bank of Spain paper, which basically they linked it to the Chicago plan to 100% uh, money to, you know, maybe the need act approach, if you like, uh, that you have supported. Yes, I'm, yes, all, no. I'm all in favor of that. And as uh, uh, I guess, you know, I was the advisor to Dennis Kucinich, uh, economic advisor, when he was running for president and sponsoring uh, uh, that ad. Uh, the Chicago plan deserves to be uh, discussed uh, much more. People say that, well, if banks are only like savings banks, how is the economy going to get the money to grow? Well, the money uh, can come quite simply. Uh, when a bank, uh, uh, a bank under the Chicago plan will find a credit worthy borrower, uh, it will draw on an account and open a, a line of credit with the treasury. So the treasury will provide the deposits that the banks in turn will lend out at uh, some form uh, of, of uh, uh, of commission. So there's no reason that the Chicago plan has to be uh, deflationary. Uh, the difference is that the treasurer, if the government being essentially operating as a public bank, uh, the government will not make speculative loans. Uh, a, a bank under the Chicago plan would not be able to borrow money from the treasury to fund a corporate takeover uh, that uh, strips assets uh, or speculation or derivatives gambles or all the things that uh, Grove Citibank uh, insolvent in uh, 2008. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, uh, I think the, the Chicago plan is probably uh, the most practical uh, solution that's been put. Uh, the easiest way to discuss the needed reform is to frame it in terms of the Chicago plan, since that's what uh, the Chicago school itself was discussing from uh, the 1930s onwards. The Chicago plan, uh, in my mind, would be part of modern monetary theory, uh, um, working through the banks. Thanks so much. Great answer. Okay. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, uh, Michael. There. So I, I lower your hand. And then uh, I think, uh, who was next? I think Tune, Tune Revskad Nielsen has been waiting for some time. Thank, uh, thank you so much. Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael Hudson, and uh, I don't know if you remember me from New York five years ago. I'm from Denmark. Anyway, um, I want to. I want. I'm. I'm very interested in this, this question about rent and its uh, affiliation or relation to to money, and especially the money creation by private banks. And uh, it comes to my mind, uh, and especially in these times, in this very low interest environment that we are seeing in the moment that money is seeking down into the rent, into the land. Uh, and, so, uh, and so debt is, has actually, we've seen, become a privilege of the few to, act, to, to go into the land, sort of to, 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 um, to sort of privatize uh, rent. And so what we're seeing now is actually that the profits of big financial institution of financial investors uh, is much more now um, related to land ownership than into some sort of just owning um, uh, debts or, or stocks or whatever. So could you tell me or us something about this relation and how it's evolved uh, throughout, I'd say, since 2008? Maybe? Well, now you're asking questions about reality. So I can see you're never going to qualify for the Nobel Prize. 80% uh, of bank loans are to the real estate interest, they're mortgage loans uh, from the United States uh, to Britain. So essentially rent is for paying interest. If 80% of bank loans are to real estate and uh, almost all of this uh, 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 real estate represents uh, the capitalized value of land, then uh, 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 most interest is 
essentially uh, the payment of rent. What that means is that the rent that used to be paid to the uh, hereditary aristocracy of Europe, the landlords, is now paid to the banks. Because if you want to buy a house, uh, you uh, go to a bank and uh, you uh, say, I want a loan to buy this, uh, this home. And you're bidding against other people that also want to buy a home. And uh, the winning uh, bidder uh, for the price of the home is the, the bidder who's willing to pay all of the uh, rental value of that, whether it's a, uh, you rent it out or if it's your own home, what you would have to pay in rent, uh, who's willing to pay all this rent to the bank is debt service, is more, mainly is mortgage interest, uh, especially when you have zero amortization loans as you uh, uh, begin to be developed in 2008. So, uh, you have the banks playing the role in today's society that landlords used to do. And in a way, that's uh, what makes neo-feudalism uh, both different from and like earlier feudalism. Uh, today, uh, people uh, can live wherever they want. You're not tied to live in the house that you were born in. Uh, you can live wherever you want. But wherever you live, if you want a home of your own, you're going to have to borrow money uh, the rental value uh, to pay uh, the banks, and that's uh, up to 40. Uh, the uh, US government will guarantee uh, bank loans that absorb up to 43% of uh, your income. 43% is pretty much, I mean, that's a, a huge uh, amount when you also have to pay 15% uh, uh, Social Security and other taxes. You have to pay income taxes, you have to pay health care. Uh, uh, a huge amount. So, uh, and if uh, you pay rent, uh, well, then the landlord has uh, said has bought the house probably on credit, and the landlord pays the rental value for the bank. So, yes, uh, uh, today rent is for paying interest, and the reciprocal of that is that most interest payments are the capitalization of rent instead of taxing it. Now, that's why the free marketers are so much against taxation. If the government, if uh, all of this increase in land value uh, that the landlord doesn't create. The increase in land value is caused by prosperity. It's caused by city spending on goods and services, by building subways and transportation, parks, schools. If the land value is created by the public, the public, the government doesn't need to tax uh, income. It doesn't have to tax labor. It doesn't have to pay tax capital. All of the costs of government uh, can be paid for by uh, essentially uh, the, uh, the land rent and the natural resource rent of the oil and gas industry uh, and uh, the monopoly rent. That's the Thorstein Veblen uh, law. Veblen developed this in his uh, book on private ownership, uh, uh, where uh, at, at that point he said, well, if you look at cities today, any, any city can be looked at as a real estate project where uh, the banks are funding uh, the real estate developers that buy speculators who try to sell their property at a profit, leaving uh, 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 the bottom of the economic pyramid holding the bag and having to pay all this increased uh, real estate value, mainly uh, land rent, uh, to the banks as interest. So the, the banking system has become the main protector of the rentier interests, the, the main protector of not taxing the land, of not taxing oil and gas and mining companies, of not taxing monopolies. Uh, so the, the banks have uh, become the main lobbyists for uh, uh, a society that uh, lets uh, its economic surplus be taken in the form of economic rent instead of uh, uh, paid uh, to the government as a means of funding taxes. And that's what forces the government to tax industry to tax labor and essentially to uh, uh, create a, an economy that's more and more expensive because rent is an element of price but not value. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the taxes are essentially what's deindustrialized the United States. So the business plan of the commercial banking sector is deindustrialization. It wants to uh, suck so much uh, revenue out of the economy that the economy has become the high cost rent economy, uh, deindustrializes and becomes dependent on countries uh, that don't have uh, a banking class in control. Wow, okay.
Thanks, Michael. Uh, we, we, we jump to the next one. Let me Stevie. Uh, Downs. Uh, Jesse, I, I think uh, Petra was uh, be actually before me. So. Oh, fa thanks a lot. I lost that. So then we take Petra first. Thanks for being a gentleman. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Thank you so much. I'm from Germany and I, I listen very, really carefully and I'm astonished about some things you said. And um, okay, you, you, you said, okay, we should leave the Eurozone. I think that's not in our power to achieve. So, and if you talk about the government and say, okay, they are also not really in control. So we have this one person that is in control. Uh, so I don't see any realistic view to, to come out of that. So what I'm thinking is, okay, there is still one great power in the world that can stand up against, for example, the US uh, government and, 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 and your military force, and that's, that's China. So what is your view on that? I mean, all the plans uh, the government and, and the US can, can make, I mean, is there really a chance that China stands up and, and, and for example, they, uh, gives loans to other countries so they don't have to be enslaved from US or any such things? I mean, can you see something of that? Well, most of my work in the last five years has been uh, with China. I was a professor of economics at the uh, uh, Peking uh, University for a number of years, and I have professorships at a number of universities in China, uh, and I'm working very actively there. Uh, the difference between China and the West is China has kept banking in the public domain. The bank, uh, uh, the bank of China, uh, is uh, the main creditor, not commercial banks. What that means is that if you're a corporation in China and you can't pay the debt. Uh, and the uh, government, the China uh, uh, Bank of China, being part of the government, says, "Well, wait a minute. We need this company to stay in business. So we're going to write down uh, if we foreclose, if we say, well, 'Well, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go bankrupt and uh, be sold off, mainly to an American buyer or somebody on the cheap that'll just carve you all up.' Uh, it's going to say, we're not going to let you go bankrupt and fire all your people. We're going to save you. Uh, we're going to alleviate uh, the debt." Same thing uh, with uh, the foreign countries. Uh, it doesn't want to uh, treat foreign countries like the United States treats them through the International Monetary Fund. Uh, it, it, in trying to extend its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, it's trying to have good political relations with these countries, and it's trying to make productive loans. Uh, uh, it's trying to say, okay, we're going to uh, make a loan to, to you, but uh, we don't want to uh, bankrupt you because that would make it impossible. Uh, if you impose austerity, like the IMF insists that you do, austerity makes it even harder for you to repay the loan. So what we're going to do, we're going to make this loan and you'll uh, repay us and uh, we'll make uh, the money uh, in uh, the port charges for the ports that we're buying, or we're, develop we're providing infrastructure. We're going to make the money off the infrastructure. Um, uh, I had a long discussion with Pepe Escobar uh, on this uh, uh, the other day. And uh, uh, the argument made against uh, the Belt and Road Initiative was, well, look, the Suez Canal went bankrupt. The, the Panama Canal by Lesseps uh, went bankrupt. You know, uh, building canals and infrastructure really doesn't pay. Well, China says, we're not in it for the money. We're not developing uh, this uh, transport and Belt and Road infrastructure in order to uh, make a profit. We're uh, developing it in order to create a region-wide prosperity in which we can all share. So the whole concept of, uh, uh, of government banking, making loans for, uh, uh, on the basis basically of industrial engineering. In America, uh, industrial companies are run by financial engineers. In China, uh, in, uh, financial company uh, loan making are designed by industrial uh, engineering principles saying, what kind of industry, what infrastructure do we need in China? What do we need for uh, uh, train transport, for uh, uh, highway transport, for public uh, power transport? So uh, you have it in verse. So the conflict between the United States and uh, with Europe is, is the tale. Uh, 
uh, in China isn't a conflict about who's going to make better uh, iPhones or commercials. It's a conflict to the death of economic systems because the United States and Europe cannot permit any country to survive that is not a polarizing the economy. It's a conflict between an economic system that impoverishes the economy, which is the political uh, aim of the European governments uh, and the American governments, or an economy whose, that is uh, structured so as to help economies grow, which is uh, China's uh, pragmatic uh, industrial economy. So we're really talking about the, uh, the, a conflict not among nations, but between uh, what was industrial capitalism, or in, which is evolving into socialism, or finance capitalism. Uh, the United States represents finance capitalism, and it's imposed this on Europe as its satellite. Uh, so, and as long as Europe lets itself become a satellite for finance capitalism, it's going to end up uh, as deindustrialized as uh, the United States is, and uh, the industry is going to be done by uh, uh, an industrial capitalist socialist uh, country uh, such, such as China. So, uh, and uh, again, that's why you're not going to have a Nobel Prize given to explain why China is succeeding and uh, the US and Europe is not. Uh, the Nobel Prize would be in a parallel universe, uh, the United States and Europe would survive and uh, we'll just forget about China, that's exogenous. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you for your question, Petra, and uh, thank you, thank you, Michael. So now I think it's our gentleman, Stevie Downs. You is is you up for it? <laughs> yes, right, um, Michael. Uh, thanks very much indeed for a very thought-provoking talk. Uh, really, really enjoyed that. Um, just uh, as an aside, Michael, uh, I quite see what you mean when you talk about um, the, the Euro zone uh, and the national territories not therefore being in control because they don't have their own currencies. But my concern for that is that with the general right wing uh, drift that there is around, that there, there's that nationalism, if we were to, to as I see it, go back to that would be a, a retrograde step. For me, especially in Ireland, in the north of Ireland here, I look to Europe. Uh, I feel it, uh, that cultural affinity um, with Europe. Um, and uh, to, to think that we would be retreating behind national territories again would, would terrify the life out of me. Now, I would go the opposite uh, end and, and instead of looking for um, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, national ter the territories to be lost in the euro, that there ought to be a, say, a greater political union in the whole of Europe. That might be one way around it. But however, that, that's, leave that aside. Can I, can I mention that um, seemingly one of the implications of, of what you have said about with your focus on debt is that we could have a clean slate scenario, in which case that would take us back to the start of, the, of a cycle again that's part of capitalism. I'm just wondering what, what your, your thinking is about the processes of capitalism in relation to that tension uh, that is between labor and capital and with particular uh, focus on artificial intelligence and what the future then holds for that labor and capital tension. Well, you made a number of points. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, almost everybody I knew agreed with you, your views about nationalism. After all, they just uh, uh, gone through World War II and they looked at that as an expression of nationalism. Uh, in principle, it seemed to be that the uh, antidote to nationalism was going to be globalism, but nobody expected that globalism would turn in to what it's turned out today. So if nationalism is bad, so is a unilateral globalism run by the United States as nationalism. Globalism today is American nationalism. Your Europeans are the most nationalistic, uh, viciously nationalistic uh, people of all, but they're nationalistic for the United States. Uh, the European leaders, I remember once I met the Europe, uh, I was invited to meet with uh, uh, Helmut Schmidt, uh, European, uh, uh, when he was running Germany, he was Germany's uh, uh, leader, uh, and Volkswagen had invited us over. There are only four people in the room, uh, and uh, uh, Schmidt, uh, we, uh, because I, I could speak German, 
uh, Schmidt came, uh, thought that if I was there, I must be there from the US government. Uh, I don't know why Volkswagen invited me, but he, he uh, came over and he assured me that his loyalty was to the United States uh, and that not to worry that uh, he would really do whatever the United States wanted him to do. He didn't quite do it that way. But I think every uh, European leader probably once a month promises that to the United States. They, you, your leaders represent the United States financial interests, not your country. Uh, and uh, uh, essentially, you're, uh, you're, you're not run by presidents or by parliament, you're run by NATO, especially uh, in, in Sweden. Uh, uh, most, uh, uh, that's why I, I'm so sorry that the author of uh, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series died because he was into that, showing uh, the whole effect of that covert uh, uh, NATO uh, right-wing bit, bit there. So uh, uh, what, you, what you consider to be European integration is rotten nationalism. Uh, it's rotten American financial uh, financialism because the European, uh, 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 the Brussels, the European Union government is the most right wing, militaristic, vicious uh, group. And uh, if, uh, last week, uh, Prime Minister, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, Sergei Lavrov, uh, gave a wonderful, wonderful speech saying that, well, Russia uh, is quite happy to deal with uh, national governments, uh, such as uh, Germany, France, Italy on their own terms, it's, not, it's given up trying to deal uh, with, uh, with Europe. Because Europe uh, being uh, your right-wing uh, globalists, uh, your idea of globalism is American nationalism. And uh, uh, essentially Lavrov said, you're, you're, you're puppets. We're not going to deal with your puppet government, uh, 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 pan-European government. We're going to hope that there is some way that individual governments can somehow uh, break away from this order. And uh, uh, the Eurozone is uh, structured in such a rotten way with its, uh, its financial rules and its monetary rules, it cannot be, uh, uh, be resolved. And I suspect your population will and living standards will have to drop by about 25 to 30% before there's an awareness that Things don't have to be this way. Things can be different, but uh, we have uh, uh, only governments can create their own money. Uh, if, if you leave a global money creation, it's going to be American military spending. That's the dollar standard today. That's global uh, uh, money creation. So uh, that that basically is uh, the uh, you have to put the. Uh, the uh, contrast between nationalism and globalism is in a completely different context than it was uh, 60 years ago uh, when uh, we used to have these discussions and when it seemed to be a good idea, uh, idea for Europe to integrate. The European common market, seven countries was, we were all for it, especially for the common agricultural policy that made itself independent. The United States kept trying to break down the common agricultural policy and sponsored uh, uh, a group of really bad countries uh, to make to uh, try to oppose Europe. The bad countries, of course, were Scandinavia and England. Uh, uh, they created EFTA, the uh, European Free Trade Area, and the idea was that the free trade area would do would act as proxies to uh, uh, act essentially break down and uh, uh, prevent any kind of a progressive social democratic or socialist uh, continent, continental Europe. And uh, uh, that's the problem. You have the Scandinavian English speaking sphere uh, is uh, part of the uh, militarist NATO uh, right wing sphere uh, trying to block uh, any ability of uh, the original seven countries uh, operating together. And of course, now that uh, uh, they uh, expanded NATO and the Eurozone for the uh, for the East, uh, the Baltic countries and Poland, uh, you have uh, absolute uh, paralysis, uh, inability uh, to do anything at all. Uh, so I'm, I guess that, that I was stuck on the first part of your question. I don't remember the rest. Well, uh, so just shall I repeat uh, the, the second part? Uh, just summarize it. Rem remind me of what the topics were. It, it was artificial intelligence and the tension between labor and capital. Well, the key to artificial intelligence is uh, what we all learned as a computer programmer, garbage in, garbage out. 
uh, you can have, uh, you have uh, artificial intelligence, somebody putting in uh, uh, the kind of model that Nobel prizes are given for, uh, you're going to uh, have your economy shrink by 30% right away. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, applied to uh, plan the European economy would, would shorten your lifespans, raise your suicide rates, uh, impoverish the country, lead to unemployment, and you'd all end up uh, looking like Greeks. That's the, the art of, that is the plan that the financial sector would program into uh, this uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, means of controlling your economy. I think it's an awful idea. Because who's going to be doing the input? Garbage in, garbage out. No, well, that's, that's that's exactly my point. I was just wondering about about the future, uh, really, uh, and the opposition to it. Anyway, thank thank you very much. Uh, there are others there wanting to ask. Thank you. Thanks, Stevie. Okay, uh, Elian. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering what you suggest as an individual. What do we do as individuals? Because we're seeing our money deteriorate. We can't maintain paying the bills anymore. You know, what do you recommend we do as individuals to get out of the system? I don't know. I, I uh, everybody, every individual is different, and. Uh, uh, Every individual has their own ability to do things. Most people are not able to do very much. Uh, uh, some individuals who agree with what uh, you've been saying, like Dennis Kucinich, uh, tried to uh, thought, well, I'm going to run for Congress and go into the government. But so the Democratic Party said, uh, we, we cannot, uh, democracy is not going to work if we have someone like Dennis Kucinich in the government. So we're going to redesign the voting district, and we're going to just get rid of this district. So they got rid of his district, and so he had nowhere to run anymore. Um, the, uh, the party politics uh, is pretty much blocking uh, anyone from uh, getting, from operating politically uh, in a government. I don't know what you can do. The only thing I can think of you doing is start, please starve quietly. I'm starving. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wish I could say, I don't, nobody, I don't know anybody. Who knows what to do about this? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my father was uh, uh, a political prisoner in America uh, for adv advocating the overthrow of the government by force and violence uh, because he was a pacifist. And they threw, they accused all the pacifists of uh, force and violence because uh, uh, it's a long story with Minneapolis, which was the world's only Trotskyist uh, city. So uh, I'm the last person to ask about uh, a question like that. Mm -hmm. It's just that I'm very concerned that I'm watching myself paying a mortgage that I could easily afford before. Now it's getting harder. I'm supporting grown up children that are struggling to pay their own rents. I've got an elderly father. You know, I'm finding life is getting harder and there doesn't seem to be any solutions. And I'm just wondering, how do we change what we're doing? Well, here's the irony that uh, the, the, what the people want, people like you, most people want what you want. They want affordable housing. They want in America, public medical care, but there's no party representing these things that you want. And if you do create a party, then it's excluded. Uh, I was in Latvia for quite a few years. I was uh, uh, the research director for the uh, graduate, uh, Riga Graduate School of Law. And I wrote uh, the program for the largest Latvian political party, uh, Harmony Center, which was the, uh, uh, the Russian speaking uh, party. Uh, they have one third of the population of uh, Latvia, uh, one third of the votes, but uh, they were completely excluded uh, from the government. Uh, the program that I drew up for them was a land tax. Uh, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd recapture what the kleptocrats had taken away by uh, taxing the rental value of the land that they gave themselves. You tax away the value of the uh, public uh, infrastructure that they'd uh, given themselves. Well, uh, obviously uh, they were simply excluded from government. So you have uh, the political party system is blocking any movement by the democracies. So the first thing is you have to let people know that you, uh, 
you do not live in a democracy. A democracy would enable you to vote for the policies that you want so that you'd be able to have affordable housing. You'd be able to have uh, a good paying job. Uh, but uh, people, uh, if you want that, you're excluded from the party process that actually makes the laws uh, or from the court process. Uh, and uh, that's why the United States is trying to uh, take the power to make laws itself away from governments themselves and have an international body of law, which it tried to do with the uh, uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership and the uh, TTIP with Europe, uh, which would have essentially taken away uh, government's ability to make their own environmental laws, to make their own social regulatory laws. Uh, that's uh, the kind of globalism uh, that you have. The, the idea is to exclude uh, the, uh, the people from having any voice in government. That's how the European uh, politics is being structured today. And uh, you have to somehow uh, create a political movement that uh, does what the 19th century did. The whole 19th century, from Ad uh, the physiocrats to Adam Smith to John Stuart Mill to Marx uh, onward, it was all an attempt to uh, free itself from the, the post-feudal landed aristocracy. Uh, and it, it seemed to be evolving into socialism until World War I. And World War I changed all of that. You have to essentially pick up the fight all over again, except today, instead of getting rid of the hereditary landed aristocracy, you're getting rid of the financial interests and the American uh, militarists behind them. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, what we are trying in Positiva Penge is actually to start this grassroots movement. It's not like a political party, but it's like uh, through the monetary system. So we use the monetary system for the benefit of society and its uh, citizens, actually. And democracy is a very important thing for it because it doesn't matter what system you have. If it's corrupt, it's corrupt. Okay, so it needs to be a grassroots movement. So that's why we are very happy to have you here, Michael, and earlier Steve Keynes, and a few of you who actually understand these parts really <laughs> deeply and have an extensive experience. Uh, we have a few more questions, but uh, I, I think we need to start, start to end this. And, and I, I, because it's been two hours, and I think we will need a rest. And uh, I'm quite sure there's quite a lot, me included, I would like to have you back, but we can talk about that later, I think, Michael, because this has been very, very uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, rich on uh, information and from your experience and from uh, actually real data and not just theories about things. So, uh, so, so I would say that uh, we, we, we conclude there. Sorry, guys, you and Lotte, there's three people raising up their hands, but I think we're running out of steam. It seems like it. So, so I, I once again, uh, all of you here, just give a, a digital big applause to Michael for all, all his performance today. Very wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. And there's quite a lot in the in the chat too. To, so says thank you. And earlier said that thank you a lot, even though they had to leave earlier. They really appreciate uh, uh, that you share all the knowledge and all the experience you have. Because the thing that I think that you have is, is very unique is that you have the historical perspective and you also have been in the political arena and in the, in the uh, economical arena too. So you know you have seen it in real, real life also and that is really, really a, a good combination to learn from, I would say. And, and, and the short conclusion here, it, it is like, well, there has and still is this power struggle between financial elites who wants the power to them. And an easy way to do that is to, to restrict what the government run by democratic principles can do. That's, I think, is the short uh, conclusion of that. And private debt, private debt need to be handed. Hand you might up. have the monetary issue with the military issue because uh, all of the, your central bank reserves held in dollars are to fund the American military. And that's, that's really at the root of uh, much, much of the problem. Okay. The financial problem is a, is a military problem, and then it's, it's a rent, a problem of economic rent and unearned income. So I think you, you have to integrate the monetary problem with, with rent and military. Mm.
Okay. I, I can I can I can hear that you're speaking yourself back here shortly. <laughs> I love that. So so uh, I think transcript. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's important that you st end this uh, kind of educations with the solutions uh, time as well because I am a grassroots princess and I have a method to gather people on the streets. I'm working with the uh, crayons on the streets. And uh, we're just waiting for the spring now, so we can uh, we can do this. And we're working with direct democracy, and we are going to ask the question: What is uh, democracy, and what tools do we need to uh, to use democracy? And we will get it in from the people, and we write it uh, on a big, 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 big ground in uh, the center of Stockholm. I think this is a historical question, and I'm, I'm just finishing my book, uh, The Collapse of Antiquity, which is a sequel to Forgive Them Their Debts, which is my economic history of Greece and Rome. And you can see from the very beginning that what people call democracy is, was really an oligarchy. Uh, so I, I think that uh, discussing these questions cannot be put in the abstract. They have to be treated almost more as a historical question and an empirical question than a uh, philosophical abstract question. Yeah. Okay. Agree. So, thanks a lot. We we like a lot to everybody who's working for pro democracy, uh, regardless of what they do, because democracy is a good thing. So, anything, Michael. Uh, I I get back to you with the, the recording and the, the transcribe transcription when we done that, and uh, then we can talk uh, further to see if we could put put up an, uh, <clears throat> another go. Uh, with new topics because I love it would be fun and there's plenty of people already said that they would like that. Well, if so, we're I just want to leave you with one thought. Democracy yeah. is the political stage immediately before oligarchy. That's what Aristotle <laughs> said. Okay. Well, th thank you for making our evenings here very, very cheerful. You are about to an uh, anarchy. Are you? Are you suggesting energy? Uh, anarchy? No. 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 So can we can we just uh, uh, keep order here? Sorry to that, Michael. Thanks a lot, and thank you to all the audience, and and catch you later on. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, I guess we go here. There we go.